how's it going, bro? How, how have you been since we last saw each other? Pretty good, man. It's been a while, like uh, I think six months or so, and back in Australia now, kind of spent uh, right up till September in Turkey, and then was going to join you, and then uh, had to go back, had to go back yeah. to Melbourne. Um, and the weather's been pretty shitty here, but just been back grinding, like getting shit done, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, not too much else to report. Kind of looking at everyone else, sort of living it up in Dubai and uh, and getting jealous. <laughs> You gotta come, bro. I mean, I'm I'm gonna go in uh, in like January time. So if you come same time, we can all link up together. We can have a have a good time. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. So let's give everyone a bit of a intro about who you are. You're a eight figure e commerce guy, or multi, it would be fair to say multi eight figure, multi eight figure e commerce yeah, guy. Yeah. So well, yeah. So g- yeah. give us like an overview of like who you are and like. We'll get into like your story, how you got started, where you came from, and then we'll just go from there. Yeah, yeah. So I've kind of been in e com since March 2020. So I got started right, like literally um, when everything was getting shut down and locked down in Australia. Um, so yeah, pretty much perfect timing. Um, started a, I mean, before then, I was kind of like dabbling in you know, doing some dropship stuff. I was doing like online personal training, uh, just like little side hustles here and there, and then sort of took it seriously March, 2020. Um, ended up building like a, started out as a dropship store and then sort of what we were selling kind of got some legs. So we decided to keep running with it. Um, and we ended up turning that into a, yeah, an eight figure brand that ended up turning over sort of like, I think 12 or 14 million us in in sales and we ended up selling that a few months ago um which was which was cool to get that to happen and then we've since built a new brand as well so uh about 12 months ago we started a second one um which i probably wouldn't advise doing but yeah we had two running at the same time um and that one should do probably bigger than the than the first one so we're hoping to do the same thing like grow it up nice and big uh and then sell it like 12 or 18 months from now um, and that one is, is probably just on about 10 million now in sales since we, since we started. And when did you start that one? Why did we start the second one? When? When? So we started the second one, it would have been September, 2021. Um, so we're still running the first one. It's a health brand, um, selling sort of like pain relief products, neck pain relief products, back pain relief products. Um, so we're in a, like a transition phase with the new owners still working on that one in the day to day um, and kind of getting like a, you know, an earn out and, uh, uh, and some sort of consulting fee to keep running that. That kind of ends at the end of February. Um, so it's kind of perfect timing for us. Like we had the new brand started, you know, beforehand and we can kind of just get straight into focusing on that full time. Yeah. So. A lot was said there, so I want to actually break that up into different parts of the podcast because there's some aspects that could be interesting to people who are getting started and then other stuff that's more interesting for more advanced people like when they sell their brand or like what's the process for that kind of thing. So let's go back to the original, uh, to the start back March 2020. So you said you were doing some personal training before March and then COVID kicked in and then you decided to do e and am I right in saying the first brand? actually made you eight figures the first brand you ever tried or did you have failures before that leading up to yep. it? um so i had one like I, I tried you know drop shipping this product for about a month in february um and mm. made some sales that was like the first e-com venture made some sales and that was enough to go like okay like this shit isn't a scam like people you, you can like spin up a store and run some ads and, and make some sales um and then I was working a job at the time and it got like really, really busy. So I basically had a month off and, and was just sort of fully focused on my full-time job. Then when that ended, uh, partnered up with, with my business partner now. And yeah, that was the health brand. So the second one that I did, it was the first one he actually did his, his first time ever in, in e-com. And um, yeah, it started slow. Like we, we got to like 10 or twelve thousand dollars in sales a month and sort of we're, we're hitting that each month like nothing crazy literally like you know a thousand bucks profit a month um but enough to be like all right it works and, and to keep going and then we had one breakthrough i think like september or october of 
2020 when we found a new product, like a neck pain relief product, and we scaled that up to like a couple of hundred grand a month. And then, you know, since then, mm -hmm. it's sort of steadily increased. So what was like the difference between what you guys were doing and then, so you brought in this new product, the neck pain product. What was it about that product that made yep. things start to increase? Like what was the difference between what you were selling and did you take a different approach? Was it new angles? What was it? Yeah, so it was uh, basically, so we were selling like uh, this this back stretching this back stretching product, and it was essentially mm. the same mechanism, but for the neck, and the market really hadn't seen it before. So we were kind of the first ones selling that kind of product, um, and I think that made it honestly a, a lot easier. Our marketing wasn't any better. Uh, our like we, we were honestly like retarded. To, like I, I, I'm not going to say that on the podcast, but we were ret yeah, <laughs> we were retarded. Um, <laughs> and um, so it was literally the offer. It was just a better offer that no one had seen before, and that made it uh, a shit ton easier um, to market it. Basically, that's sick. So the back pain product might have been the one I'm thinking. I don't know. Can we say the product specifically, or no? You want to avoid that? Yeah, yeah, like I, we, I, I, I can say, yeah. So it's like a back, it's like a back stretcher. I mean, it, it was like heaps of people were running it on TikTok, and heaps of people were making like organic content. Uh, and yeah, it's been it, it's been sort of like a pretty popular dropship product as well. Was that um, the one? Is it the one that you so put yeah. on the ground? It's kind of like a it's like a hump, and then you lie on the top of it, and stretch exactly. your back. Ah, bro. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, gonna get an angry because uh, <laughs> so I mean, years ago, years ago when I did drop shipping. Um, I looked into uh, drop shipping using ads and stuff, and that was one of the products that I was looking at in like 2018, 2019, bro. But I never ran with it because I was like, oh, it's probably sad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was it was like saturated when we ran it. But looking back now, if we ran it at that time during COVID with the skills we have now, I have no doubt we would have like been able to make it like crush. Like I reckon we would have really done done well with it we just didn't really know what we were doing yeah mm -hmm. yeah so i guess that that's something we can touch on like um one of the things that everyone's always kind of i guess worried about is like saturation like is this is this product saturated is this you know niche saturated if you are going into a more like competitive niche like what do you look at in order to differentiate yourself let's talk about ecom specifically what do you do to differentiate yourself in a more competitive Let's say you're drop shipping a certain product that other people are drop shipping. How do you separate yourself from the pack and actually, you know, beat them basically? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we look at like less kind of drop shipping style stuff now and more uh, things that we can, you know, actually cr like put patents on and, and make it like more legitimate. Uh, just mm -hmm. with the experience we had with our first brand, where where pretty much everything could have been ripped and and we just didn't sell it for for as much as we could have. Um, but I mean, any, any product that kind of applies to, we're really looking for an edge that fits our skill set. So our skills are like in the paid media and the creative side, that's what we're good at. And then I guess the, the CRO and, and creating like the sales funnel. So if, if we're looking at an offer and it looks like those guys have the same skill set as us, meaning they're super dialed in with their funnel, with their creatives, with their ad buying as well. And it's pretty easy to tell, like you can see when someone's like, you know, strong at performance marketing, we're probably not going to go after that. Um, whereas if we're, if we're finding something, Hey, this is selling really well. Um, and these people look quite weak in performance marketing, their funnels weak, their creatives weak, uh, possibly they're not executing that well. That's like something that we go, okay, well it's still selling, even though they're not doing all these things, let's go after that. Um, as long as it ticks, mm -hmm. you know, a few other boxes as well margin um is a big thing in e-com and, and like broad appeal so uh yeah i can touch on a bit more of that but that's kind of the the main thinking hmm. so I, I think from what i understand you guys approach e-com slightly different than what the masses do and you more focus on like long form direct response funnels right rather than just like go straight to a shopify store yep yeah, exactly. why is that, why is exactly. that beneficial to just going straight to Shopify and what's the benefits of taking this more longer direct response approach than, you know, just sending people to a regular Shopify page? Uh, I mean, I think when, when you take that approach, you're able to, uh, you're able to really craft a story 
around whatever you're selling. So anytime like anytime you're able to, to craft some story and if it's compelling to the person buying whatever it is you're selling, um, that's obviously a huge benefit. It also allows, allows you to like build up the value um, of something a lot more. So when you do finally you know reveal the price, it's it's a way different proposition versus when you're just sending someone to a product page and the price is there. Um, even smaller things like when you when you're sending someone to pages like that, it, you get really good quality scores with your ad platforms um, mm. because people are actually just like reading the page for longer. Then you get yeah. cheaper clicks. Um, so even if the click itself isn't converting any better, you're getting cheaper clicks. So your earning per clicks are a bit higher. Uh, small things like that. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of reasons, but I'd say the main would be like being able to sell something with a story. Um, and also probably it, it allows you to kind of break up the offer a little bit more. So if you're selling something that's pretty commoditized, which a lot of stuff is in e-com, um, mm. using long form, you can really build up the value of the offer uh, mm. as well as like break it down in components. So you're not just selling the physical product, you could be giving like free gifts and you know, memberships and all of those kind of things as well that you can't do as well with the product page. Yeah. So I think that that's actually a really good way to like differentiate. Like, like you said, if, if you get people stuck on the page for a longer time and you can communicate the pain points, you can communicate the selling points of the product and you can actually break down exactly how the offer is going to work then that is a way that is the way to differentiate yourself in like a saturated market and so like if someone is starting out their e-commerce brand it's actually well it's the way to differentiate but would you say it's a really like advanced way to sell a product because you're having to write pretty elite copy right um i i would say so i mean the, the copy doesn't have to be like you know it doesn't have to be like agora level as long as you really understand the target market um, which is going to let you sort of touch on, on, on the pain points uh, and the right things and, and sell something that people actually want. Um, mm. But yeah, it is, it is a slightly more advanced way of going about it for sure. Um, but if you're selling that kind of product, like something that does solve like a, a real pain point, if it's health or if mm. it's skincare, then it's a lot easier to, to, to have something that's really profitable and you can spend way more on ads. Um, it's a different mm -hmm. story if it's you know apparel or something like that. You obviously don't want to do something do long form, um, yeah. but yeah, I just find it, it it's it's more advanced. Yeah, but it means you can just spend a shit ton more on ads and scale things up a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean I think that if if you're going to get into e-commerce, you may as well. I mean it's you're doing yourself like a disservice by not trying to find these pain solving problems. And like what's kind of like your process for? if you find like a new product or you're trying to research what kind of, I mean, obviously it's the, th it's the three like typical niches, health, wealth, relationships, right? And you can dive into those sub niches to find which products are going to fit those problems. So if you're trying to find a problem, a product that solves a problem, like what's your process for that? Um, I guess we, we try and do like problem first now. So we would mm -hmm. really, we would go into product first when we were a little bit less advanced and, um, which is fine, but you're you're most often just getting the scraps. Like you, like we yeah. see, like oh, these people are selling the back stretcher. Let's also sell the back stretcher. Now we try and go problem first. So we're really trying to look at like deep problems that people that haven't really been solved that well. So like mm -hmm. a good example of what I was looking at the other day was migraines. Um, so really, we're looking and going and just doing a shit ton of research, forums, Reddit, Amazon, and looking at all the different old solutions that people. Um, have been using and then you're basically taking one of those old solutions and seeing if there's a way that one of those can be marketed a little bit better uh, and presented as like a new solution or a new mechanism or you're looking at sort of a few of the things that the old solutions didn't have um, and figuring out if there's a little tweak or something you can make and then again um, presenting that like offer as as the problem solving thing for migraines uh and then it makes everything else really easy from them you, you, your copy is easier your creatives are easier you're like mm -hmm. first to market um or if you're not first to market with that product you're at least first to market with the way you're presenting it if that makes sense yeah so rather than so people basically are getting it backwards all these like you know drop ship types they try to look 
you know, on existing ads for what people are already selling. They try to see what pro what is the hot product, but what they need to do instead is actually look at what problems people are typically experiencing and start going through the you know reviews on Amazon, Reddit, uh, different forums, etc. Find out all the pain points of the people. Find a, a product that's already working for that uh, that pain, and then put a new angle on it so it seems like a new thing. Like that um, level of awareness and breakthrough advertising. Just like put a new mechanism on it, and uh, and that's how you that's how you basically come up with a new product, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the other way does work. Like, you know. Uh, you, you, you it, it can work really well like people have, have made huge businesses literally just copying same traffic platform same offer and then yeah. just tweaking one thing yeah. like um, being better at the marketing or being better at the back end so both do work uh, I guess this is just like a new process that's that's working well for us um, and I think it's be, it, it's just a lot easier because it means you're always the the first mover versus just getting the scraps mm -hmm. yep a hundred percent and so if you were if you were trying to come up with a, a new angle for an existing product, let's say there's like one, you know, this one solution for a migraine that everyone's taking, how do you begin to come up with that new? How do you rebrand the existing thing to make it seem new to the, the people? Like, what's your process for that? Yeah, I mean, usually it, it it sort of all comes down to like the mechanism and then how that's presented. So. We've found uh, like a super effective way is is partnering with someone uh, with authority. So with our health brand, we um, basically partnered with a, a chiropractor and that allowed us to make like very specific claims around that product. So, you know, it was a pretty old solution that had been around for a while, but because we kind of re represented it as, uh, you know, the whole story around the product was was basically like this chiropractor was seeing too many patients during COVID and needed a way to like get something to them so they could massage their neck at home and blah 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 mm -hmm. blah and that was kind of the whole new story that that formed around that so it was like a powerful story and then we sort of went heavy into like research papers to actually figure out like a very specific mechanism that no one was really talking about and then that allowed us to scale up really hard so i would say it's probably like story and if you can partner with some authority figure and create or, or face of the brand and create some sort of story around it um, mm. and then like a very specific mechanism <clears throat> which is usually like you know you got to sort of like dig around to research and it's a lot easier if you're selling like a supplement or, or skincare but if it's a physical product you've sort of got to like try and manufacture something and so when you say a mechanism you mean actually I'm not even going to try and put words in your mouth like what do you mean by mechanism Basically, how the product solves the problem. So, for it's like the easiest example would be like a, um, I think there's an offer called Research, and it's basically like this, you know, really, really big offer that's done like many, many uh, millions in the direct response world. And they basically, I think their whole mechanism was that <clears throat> your, I, I think it's the right one, your putting on weight because you're not sleeping enough. And then they had this like sleep tablet, which was their solution, which would basically be like, all right, this sleep tablet fixes your sleep, which therefore makes you lose weight. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the mechanism is like the sleep tablet helping you fix your sleep, which then helps you lose weight. That's like the, the, the brand new mechanism basically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all it is. It's, it's basically just like the way the product solves the problem. And if you can explain that like vividly and back it up with research and it's it makes sense and hasn't really been done that way by anyone else in the market then you can kind of you know like print a lot of money doing that mm -hmm. and with these health related products i mean the way to find that mechanism is to dive into is to do the boring work like dive into the the research papers and actually like read a lot and see you know and have that proof of why this particular way of doing things actually solves the problem right yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and of course, when you're when you're piling up those research papers, it's like that's your proof that you can even cite in the landing page itself. Like researchers have you know, proven it. Blah 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 blah. For sure. I mean, the, the other thing as well is like you you definitely do need that proof because uh, I mean it doesn't matter so much when you're small, but as you get bigger and bigger, like when you do make these specific claims, like 
Uh, unfortunately, there's the, the FTC, and um, if you make yeah. <laughs> pretty exaggerated claims that, that are sort of founded on nothing, uh, you can get in like a fair bit of strife. So, I mean, it's also that obviously like you want to provide a good cu customer experience and like make claims that are actually legitimate. Um, but also it's like there's, there's, there's that as well once you get big enough. So you definitely do want to make sure it's, it's backed in actual research and there's something behind what you're saying. Yeah, and I think that, that what you said about getting that chiropractor on board, like that's a, a, a pretty good tip or piece of advice, I guess, for anybody out there doing e-commerce, you know, if it's a if it's a product that can be related to a specific, you know, professional in a certain niche, then simply getting that person on board, I don't know if you just pay them flat or give them a cut or whatever, but just getting them on board be almost the face of the brand, particularly if they're like kind of locally famous or, you know, famous in general. If you can get that, one, you get that authority of the person's brand if they have one, and two, you get that authority of their title, whether they're a doctor or a lawyer or like an accountant or, or whatever, or whatever it may be, a sports professional. If you get that person on, you get that authority and you can start to make more uh, trustworthy claims. Because if a, if a qualified doctor is saying that this back thing, you know, helps your back or helps your neck, you're much more likely to believe it. Yeah, for sure. I think it also like for us, our whole, um, another thing which I haven't really spoken about is like, uh, a gold mine offer is like, uh, if you can compare it to something that's, uh, like many thousands of dollars or many hundreds of dollars, but offer it as like something quite cheap in comparison, um, mm. that makes it a lot easier to scale. So with this face of the brand and the way we did the story, we kind of positioned the product as an alternative to going to the chiropractor. Basically like you're getting the chiropractor from home, but only for 50 bucks instead of like, you know, many hundreds each week. Um, and that sort of made us, we were able to position ourselves as like the, the highest priced in the whole market, um, but still convert really high because it, it still seems cheap in comparison. So that's like a, a, another thing as well. When you partner with someone of authority and create a story around the product, like it allows you to position it um, cheaper, but still sell mm -hmm. it really expensive. Yeah, and in the copy, you can anchor that price to the higher price. Like you can literally run the math on the landing page and be like, here's how much weekly chiropractor things will cost you. Over the course of six months, you know, it'll cost you like 10 grand or whatever, but then just one payment of 200 bucks or whatever for this thing or whatever the price is, you know, then you save yourself nine and a half grand basically. Yeah, exactly. That is awesome. So let's kind of go back to, um, or actually let's move on to more of the process of sort of selling that brand. Cause I think that what we covered is like, helpful for newer guys and also intermediate guys and guys that are existing already because obviously coming up with that offer is pretty crucial. But then what was the process for getting that brand up to a point where you could sell it for, I don't know how much you, how much you sold it for and I won't ask you if you don't want to say, but getting that brand up to a point where you sold it, what is like the process from actually getting people, getting the brand to a place where it can be sold, getting people interested and in, you know, What's that process, getting it over the line? Because I know when we were talking, you were, um, I can't remember if you had it. So, no, you didn't have it. So you were talking to buyers, I think, when we first started chatting about it. And then uh, back in August, I think, right? You got it sold, or August, September. Yep. So what, what was that whole process? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, fr from the start, really, you're, you're kind of, uh, from like a, just what you need to do is, uh, we went out to a broker who has a big pool of buyers. Um, and then, you know, they're, they're basically giving a whole laundry list of things that need to happen to the brand to make it sellable. Um, mm -hmm. so a few things we like any, basically any, in, in e-com, it's sort of like a minimum of two years, uh, that you need to be running the business before it's sort of like, okay, other like legitimate buyers are going to look at it. You can still sell things that are less than two years old, you're just going to be selling it for like pennies on the dollar, basically, mm. uh, unless it's some sort of like, uh, anomaly. So that was kind of the first thing we'd been running it for two years. Um, we had a good growth rate, so that helped us quite a bit. Like each month we were still growing. Um, so it made sense to, to, to say to people like, Hey, you know, you're going to get this asset and it's going to keep growing and you need to make, you know, more money and, and everything's sick. Um, and I guess, 
another thing that helped quite a bit was we were able to spin like quite a good story. So again, it's it, it, it's all kind of down to to the story, even when you're selling like a business uh, as opposed to just like a, a neck pain relief product. But we um, did we weren't listed on Amazon. We didn't have any wholesale or partnerships with with chiropractors or anything like that in terms of selling the product through clinics. So we sort of spun this really good story of like. The brand's growing at a nice rate. We don't have Amazon, so that's going to be an instant like 20% revenue uh, increase. And then you can also add wholesale. Look at all these chiropractors that are reaching out to us. We just don't have enough time to actually fulfill the demand. Um, but you can get in clinics and add another layer of revenue there. So it's like we had this really good story to go out to buyers. Um, and then and then really it's just the broker that's, that's trying to find these buyers and, um, and, and try and get the deal done. Uh, it was a little bit harder for us because it was a bit too big of a deal for a single investor, um, but it was just a little bit too small for like private equity. Um, mm -hmm. So we ended up sort of trying to target aggregators. Um, so yeah, aggregators are like people that buy up a bunch of e-com brands and try and like spin them up and then sell the whole thing. So we sort of spoke to about three or four and then two were properly interested and then we went to like LOI with one, which is where they sort of sign a letter and say, we want to buy it. And then it was about five months of sort of financial due diligence. And then we finally got the contract closed in September. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning stage, like what do these investors like want to see, like in terms of, you know, characteristics of a brand or even like numbers, like what do they want to see? And, and what do you want to have on your side so you can get the biggest payout possible essentially? Yep. So, I mean, books, like books in order is, is like, you know, number one and pretty much every single cost, uh, accounted for. Um, so that was like a big thing for us. We didn't really, ha we had everything as a shared resource. So when we had to separate out the brands, it was a bit of a messy process and, and took a bit of time. Um, trademarks and patents, if you can get any, uh, obviously like trademarks on your brand names are, a, are a must. If you can get patents on your product that gives you like some form of protection, buyers want to see that. Um, if you, uh, dependence on paid ads is a big one. So that went against us. We like spent quite a bit of money on paid ads and had, mm. you know, very little organic traffic. Um, obviously if you've got like a YouTube channel, SEO and organic really dialed in and then paid ads are on top, that's seen as like a more attractive prospect to a buyer versus something that's really just like a Facebook ads arbitrage. Um, if you're across multiple channels versus just uh, versus just Facebook as well, like if you're singly dependent on Facebook, it's gonna it's gonna hit the business value. If you're across, you know, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Snapchat, email, SMS, it's gonna help it. Um, and then really, it's kind of just like any emotes, uh, anything that makes the business hard to copy. So if you've got like mm -hmm. uh, internal IP. If you've got in-house fulfillment that makes costs really cheap, if you've got strategic relationships, partnerships with other brands or, or sort of other businesses um, that are really hard to get, things like that uh, are going to increase the exit value as well. So um, there's, I mean, I could literally go on for two hours about it, but that's kind of like a top line overview. So if you got, if you guys had spent the extra, I don't know, six months to a year to actually get the Amazon set up at least, or, you know, generating revenue and then having those wholesalers from the chiropractors, then you could have even exited for a higher amount because your acquisition would be spread across multiple channels and you would have more of a moat versus these other brands. Yeah, I'd say so. It's, it's, it's also a trade off because the new buyer like wants, uh, wants some growth trajectory. So if you've got like every single thing completely ticked off in the business and they go, Oh shit, how the hell am I going to grow this thing? Uh, yeah. that can all actually like be uh, a thing that goes against you. But for sure, like if we had Amazon and we had some wholesale, um, we would have been able to sell it for, for, you know, for, for more than what we did for sure. Mm -hmm. So is the process of the sale. So there's five months of like due diligence. They go through all your books. They look into the brand, like, front to back and then one day you just get a big fat wire payment into the bank yeah pretty much like it, it, it's usually not f five months of due diligence i think they just uh didn't <laughs> they just weren't that great at the at the finance 
Oh, and now books are a bit messy, but yeah, that's pretty much pretty much it, man. Like, uh, yeah, I was in Turkey and uh, and yeah, I got yeah a huge lump of money just wired into my account. So went and got like went to like a hostel bar and got like three uh, three glasses of uh, Blue Label at the hostel bar and um, got a big rib got a big ribeye and that, that was the night. <laughs> that's hilarious that's like the, the probably the most baller uh, person to ever step foot into a hostel bro like like <laughs> it's like oh what are you doing oh, i'm like a student on your own <laughs> little do they know <laughs> yeah it was sort of it was pretty funny so I, I i didn't actually know you were still in turkey when the when it sold because i'm trying to think oh no yeah you would have been because I, I was in yeah i was in dubai when yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, you would have been. That is sick. Yeah, yeah, it was like right, I think it was It was about a week before you came, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so you didn't, you didn't, yeah. you didn't um, celebrate more than just like, you know, some whiskey and a, and a steak. You didn't do anything big. You didn't buy anything crazy, you know? Um. So my business partner was back in Australia. So when I, when I got back to Australia and saw him, we went out and like got some drinks and smoked some cigars. That was the proper celebration. Um, in terms of buying stuff, I haven't, I haven't bought anything. Um, I like, like gold chains. I'm going to buy a big fat gold chain for myself for Christmas. Like but apart from that, I haven't really bought anything. <laughs> if you be like, and, uh, maybe a ring or something, but. <laughs> but um apart from that like we we just want the working capital for the new business um mm. as well as like you know we're going into a, a big recession so trying to be like as cash heavy as possible so we can yeah. you know scoop up some some assets or whatever else in six or 12 months time when when everything's pretty pretty uh in the shit <laughs> yeah yeah and so yeah, because you're not very like a materialistic person from from what I can gather. Like you're, you're pretty like, you know, low key about, you know, everything you do. And if you met you and didn't ask about your work or whatever, like everyone would just assume you're just like a cool guy, like regular guy, like wouldn't, you know, you're not flash, you know, you're not like flashy. Whereas like a lot of other people, when they would run up like an eight figure brand, they would be posting on social Lambos and chains and everything. But you're more of like low key. So I actually wouldn't expect you to go to insane with the cash. Um, <laughs> so you took that money and you put it straight into a new business. <laughs> when you sold it, I was like, bro, we need to hang out. We need to go on a trip or whatever. You're like, bro, I'm going back in the trenches to spin up a new brand. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like we, um, we've got like the, the new business has, has scaled quite, quite big, quite early, which is good. But obviously like e -com, you need a shit ton of money for inventory. So, We've put money into that, um, and yeah, just kind of hold, holding cash for other things. So, like looking at, I don't know. I need to do my twenty twenty three plan of whether we're going to start new businesses or just kind of focus on one. Um, but yeah, just sort of sitting tight at the moment. Um, but yeah, like not too flashy, but I do like sort of travel, uh, travel and gold chains. So that's kind of the the main two things. And luckily, those two things don't cost cost a shit ton uh, and I'm not getting like the, you know, the Rick Ross gold chain. So they don't cost too much. <laughs> Travel and gold chain. <laughs> that's the, that's the Greek in you coming out, bro. Or like the, the Mediterranean side of you. <laughs> yeah. You need to flash gold exactly. chain and you need to flash them. <laughs> so, um, so what's like, what's like actually the, I mean, you said you haven't really come up with your 2023 plan yet, but do you have an idea of roughly what you want to be doing or what's the, what's the long-term vision of how you want to take your econ businesses or, or whatever? Like, what do you envision everything looking like? Yeah. So, I mean, eventually, like, I think, uh, for me personally, and probably my business partner as well, um, we don't want to be like in the trenches forever. So, I think like I, I want to keep getting more experience running the businesses um, and at least sort of another two or three years under my belt. And it doesn't have to be just in e-com. It can literally be any business. I'm kind of pretty, you know, like e-com was just what was the opportunity at the time um, mm -hmm. and the skill sets kind of transfer to anything. Um, but yeah, keep getting more experience and skills and just, and just keep running the businesses. Uh, 
but eventually want to sort of like transition to um, kind of having a model of, of if I want to start something or if I want to buy something or build something from scratch, get like the capital and the team and put that all together and then kind of not actually be the one in the day to day running it. Um, mm. So that's kind of the next challenge for us, like trying to figure out how to structure teams and incentivize people properly and, you know, get good people in to run the things. Um, because, yeah, I, I actually don't think I, I, I'm like the best like CEO or, or, or whatever. And there are, there are better people there to run the different businesses. Um, so that's kind of the long, the long, long term thing. Um, and really just, you know, keep trying to build or buy businesses and keep kind of stacking that over time. Mm. Yeah. So you want to be finding, you want to find operators that can just run the business for you and just look at it at a high level and kind of give a little bit of guidance of what should be done. But essentially like that CEO will, will come in and, and handle most of the things for you. Yeah, exactly. Like pr pretty much, um, you know, I want businesses to, and, and, and money to be made, uh, without me being in the, in the business. Um, and we could do that now, like we could push a little bit harder now and get the and, and higher management. Um, but yeah, I think I think it, it helps to actually do it for a certain period of time and then kind of understand like all the things that can go wrong and all the fuck ups and all of that. And then go, OK, like we're ready now. Let's actually get like a CEO in and, and let's start doing business that way. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I still think I'll be running for at least like two or three more years. So how do you learn how to do that? Because that's a pretty big like transition to actually going from the guy who runs everything to then finding someone else who can run everything for you. Because I've hired a lot of people, right? And there's very, very, very few people who I would trust to you know run my whole business. And obviously, that's a, it's a different level of of you know employee that you're looking for. You're looking for somebody that has you know more of like an entrepreneurial mindset, but wants to work within a business rather than own it. Yeah. So how do you learn how to do that? Are you paying for like bigger business owners to show you the ropes? Are, are you paying to join these big masterminds? Like, how do you figure out that process? You know, now that you have like a huge influx of cash, what are you doing to actually figure out how to move into that next stage? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the easiest way is to, to learn from people who are who have either done it or already doing it. Um, so yeah, like a big one is kind of why I'm a bit more, you know, even though I like to be low key, like making an effort to post on Twitter and stuff. And, and that kind of gives me access to people who are, you know, five levels above me, 10 levels above me. Um, and yeah, if you've got a couple of followers, they respond to your DMS and, 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 you know, some of them are happy enough to give up their time. So it's that it's like specific mentors from those kind of people who are, you know, doing 200 million a year in, or like a billion a year and, and kind of like where we want to be in five or 10 years. Um, and then, yeah, it's really just like other, other people are offering it as, as, as paid services as well. So it's like seeking out those people and, and, and paying for their time if need be. And then really just like podcasts, YouTube interviews, things like mm -hmm. that. But I do think like specific mentoring uh, is definitely like the, the quickest way to get from, from A to Z and whether that comes from DMing someone and, you know, them being nice enough to like answer questions or whether you actually just go and need to pay for someone's time. Uh, I think that's like a really good use of, 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 of money to kind of get to where you want to go a bit quicker. Yeah. So have you guys been doing that then? Like, have you been able to find certain people that you can either pay or who are happy enough to give you their time to actually sit with you kind of on the journey and guide you in the right direction? Or is it more of just like a, you meet the person like once or twice and they give you like a little tidbit of information here and there, or is it more of like an actual, like over like mentorship, you know? It's a mix. We've got, uh, we've got a couple of people who we will sort of meet with maybe once every couple of months that we, that we pay. Um, and then I've got a couple of people who I'll probably meet, you know, same cadence, uh, who it's, yeah, like, like they're, you know, really generous with their time. One guy I used to work for, um, and he's in e-com as well. Um, but like, you know, streets ahead of me and I kind of meet with him once a month and he's like really good with advice and sort of, you know, things to work on and, and, and whatnot. So it's a mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say there's like somebody who's maybe they're doing, I don't know, multi six figures or, or low seven figures in revenue on Shopify. Like you can tell that they're 
that they're not shit, you know, they're not a complete beginner trying to waste your time. How do you, let's say somebody wants to get some mentorship from you, like what do you actually look for in people who like DM you or approach you that makes you think, all right, it's worth my time or this person deserves to hear a bit of advice from me? Like what does somebody need to show in order to get that from you? <clears throat> Um, I think just like really good specific questions. So, uh, yeah, I get like, uh, more DMs now than I, than I used to. Um, and most of the time people have like, you know, really good specific questions. Like it's clear that, you know, like me, they they they've hit a bottleneck or they're stuck on something and they've really kind of like thought about it. Um, and they, they sort of just like need some guidance or advice. Obviously the ones where people just ask like, can I have like, give me a winning product or like, how do I how get like very similar ones are just like, yeah, just like ones like that. I obviously just ignore. Um, but yeah, that's probably the way I think if you, t if you take the time to ask like a very specific, like, and well thought out question, um, then most of the time people do answer. Like I always answer and I found, uh, like, you know, people who are, are like, you know, nine figure net worth and doing crazy things like uh, have answered me. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think that, uh, it goes a long way. Yeah. So build like kind of having like a social profile, like if you're sliding in the Twitter DMS, like if you've got a profile that's decently built out, you've got some tweets, maybe one thing I always look for actually is do anybody, does anybody that I follow, follow them? And if they do, then I'm like, all right, well, Paul follows this guy. So then he must be like legit, you know, and then, you know, then I can actually, you know, feel like they are worth answering the question to because I get bro like in the past like two months i've blown up pretty hard on ig like from 500 followers to 30k like within the span of like one to two months and like my dms just got crazy like that overnight and just like you can really see <laughs> the difference between like the quality and dms it's insane like i always got dms on twitter but never to the volume that i have got on ig after blowing up there and like literally the amount of people that ask the, the dumbest questions they just go hey or, hey, I have a question, or, hey, how do I start? It's like, I'm never going to fucking answer that because it's like, like, you're asking such a big question. Like, I'm never going to be able to, like, there's so much context missing from the thing. It's like, what, well, what's your background? How much money you got? What, what's your existing skills? Like, you know, have you ever run a business before? Like, what do you mean, how do you start? Like, what have you tried to do so far? Like, there's so much shit. I'm not going to waste my time. <laughs> so, like, that that specific, hyper specific question is really important for, for me in particular. Like if I see that it's coming from like a decent looking, you know, uh, profile and the guy is asking me a hyper specific question about building like an agency or building up socials or whatever, then I'm much more likely to respond. And I've done it before. Like I've, I've given like free advice in the DMS, no sweat, but like, yeah, if it's just a super vague answer, a super vague response, there's no way I'm going to re reply to that. Yeah, for sure. I think, and I think having some, um, some sort of profile definitely helps as well. Um, like, like, as you said, mm -hmm. if someone follows, like you, you see someone and you go, okay, these people are following them or, um, so I definitely think like, uh, it does help sort of like putting stuff out, tweeting, following people uh, and getting, you know, your first hundred followers or whatever, even just to get some like, mm -hmm. yeah, some social proof and clout, which will help you know, DMing people who are ahead of you and, and, and getting sort of the information that you need. Yeah. So let's, let's go back a little bit to like the beginning stages. So you, you, you've run an e-commerce brand that was making eight figures, right? How much money did you start that brand with? Um, so probably about, we started with, I think we put $2,000 each into a into a bank account but then what ended up happening was um <laughs> so when we scaled up we we had like this is kind of funny to say but we actually didn't we, we ran the business with just a debit card so we didn't have a credit card for oh, um, the first 12 months <laughs> um it was pretty like i don't know man i i i like don't really understand how we made it work but so we had to tip more money in so i probably ended up tipping in about uh, we probably ended up putting about ten thousand dollars each in, um, and then the business was sort of able to uh, go on its own. Um, and then we figured out like, hey, you can actually get a credit card to run a business, and 
you know, you don't, <laughs> credit cards exist. You don't need to have <laughs> just, just a debit card. <laughs> have you heard of them? <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I see it started with 2K and then we had to sort of top up, but yeah, ended up being about 10,000 10, each. So 10K into multiple eight figures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in in, in revenue, uh, yeah, ten ten k into into multi into multi eight, um, which is good. It's been like a good uh, personal investment. So I think uh, the the sign is like keep investing in my own shit because um, mm -hmm. it seems to have the best return so far. Yeah, yeah. Is because I generally, let's say someone's like, because this was like your first, like you know. I mean, you did a little bit of online stuff before, like personal training, or whatever, but this was your first like venture into like a, a proper online business. And generally, I always advise people to not do e-commerce as their first business because, you know, it does require that money up front, like five to 10K. Running ads is more difficult than people think. There's a lot more skills that go into it. Like you're yeah. more of like a jack of all trades. Like you got to learn media buying, got to yeah. learn copywriting, got to learn design, you got to learn you know, the fundamentals of marketing, you got to learn logistics for your products, you got to learn customer relationship, like, there's so many things in e -com. So I generally like tell people to avoid e -com, But what do you think was the differentiating factor that made you succeed at, with with it being your first proper like online business versus other people that fail? Like, what do you kind of see as like the, the things that you did that were right and things that other people do are wrong? Um, I think we broke down the skills needed like pretty systematically, um, like the ones you, you listed, like we pretty much figured out like, all right, we're going to have to learn like at least a little bit of copy and we're going to have to learn creatives, uh, at least to like a certain standard media buying. So we kind of like broke down all those things, uh, and then it helped having a business partner. So it was almost like mm -hmm. we pretty much just like halved all the skills that we needed to learn, uh, and then got good enough. Uh, at those skills until things just started to work. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's like, so I used to, uh, he's like a big money Twitter guy, Nate Schmidt. He, he started posting again, which is cool. Yeah. But I used to watch all these like e-com YouTube videos and he said yeah, something and Paris which coach is as well. pretty much like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. he, um, he said, he, he said that like, if you, if you fill up the skill bucket enough, eventually like it'll overflow where like money is just a byproduct. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what we looked at. We're like, uh, and, and every time we would try and figure out what the bottleneck was in the skills. It's like, all right, we've got media buying down pat, but our fucking creative sucks. So we need to like figure that out or all right, we've got that down pat, but our copy stinks. Like we need to figure that out next and like keep trying to figure out what the next skill was that was holding us back and learn that. Yeah. And you, you really do become like a jack of all trades. Where, where would you, where did you like start to learn like all these skills? So like, cause obviously media buying is like, so such an in-depth topic, same with copy as well. such an in-depth topic. What places would you go to really try to accelerate that learning? Um, so at the start, it was just a lot of Facebook e-com groups. And then you would go down rabbit holes and people would, you know, show you copywriting books. So you'd sort of go down that rabbit hole. Um, it was really not like, if I learn a skill now, it's definitely like a much more systematic approach, uh, because I, I like know how to learn quicker and better. Um, mm. but back then it was really organic. Like you just go down rabbit holes, you'd find a book, you'd do this. Um, I think like a lot of courses, like I bought a shit ton of Facebook media buying courses, probably like five or six, um, which helped quite a bit, heaps of YouTube videos. Uh, the other thing as well, like when I like, all right, I want to do e-com properly and it was working on the side. I went and got a job at an e-com company as well. So I was just yeah. doing it like 12 hours a day. So that helped mm -hmm. quite a bit too. Um, yeah, I actually, actually yeah. remember you told me, tell me about that company as well. Can you go into details of working with that company or is it kind of uh, under, under wraps? Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I got like, uh, I, the side business was doing well. It was like going at like two, two or three hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue, but I still didn't feel ready to quit. Like, my job um so went and cold dm'd the um, <laughs> went and cold dm'd uh the founder of the Udi, uh davy and said like oh, i really want to work for you here's my shopify screenshot blah, blah blah and he's like all right like let's do it and he and um had a couple of interviews and then got started with him and, and worked with him for about eight months 
uh, and he had a bunch of, of different brands that he was running. So yeah, learned heaps from him um, and just like got to sit across all of marketing. So really got to upskill in like every little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And that obviously helped with the side business and, and it just got to a stage where it was like, I think we were at half a million a, uh, a month with the, the side business and it was like getting negligible not to work on it full time. So yeah. ended up, you know, having to quit that and, and, and run our main thing. I love what you call a half a million dollar a month business a side <laughs> business. <laughs> and you didn't quit your job until you had half a million dollar a month. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, um, that's kind of what it was though. I mean, it was still a side, a side hustle, but, uh, I think that was definitely the biggest like thing that, that, you know, I didn't realize at the time, but that was really holding us back quite a bit. Me still working, uh, you know, a full-time job and trying to run it on the side. Ever since we, I, I quit from that day, it's really just been sort of, uh, you know, quite big growth from there. So, um, yeah, full-time and anything and focus is like, uh, definitely a big level. Yeah. Just going to try to refocus the camera here right quick. One second. just being retarded there we go so and i guess that that's actually a really big um learning point because i mean you were making two three hundred k and you were like most people would be like right fuck it i'm gonna go to like bali and then just run up a course on e-com and just like cash out on that but then you were like no fuck it let me get into a company that's doing they were doing like multiple eight figs a year like i'm I'm not actually sure like how much udi was making but i know it's really famous um and so you were literally able to get in there and see the inner workings of a brand that is it is where you want to be. And so, like, I don't think a lot of people would have the kind of like humility almost to to go and do that because, like I said, if if so, most guys on Twitter, for example, were making three hundred G's a month, you know, whatever that pro- that is profit, I don't know, then they would they would just fuck off and they would start flexing and they would start telling everybody that they're the fucking big shot, and they wouldn't even consider to go get a job. You know, like to actually go work for somebody else. So like that probably would be what your unfair advantage actually is because you had the humility to go and actually work for somebody else, even when your business was doing so well. Yeah, I still, uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. Like that, that period sort of, uh, was a huge period of growth and, 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 and big learning just like, and it was, a, I, I think at the time I joined, they were doing like 200 or $250 million a year in revenue. So see how that all operated uh and he's uh a little bit younger than me so even just the mindset shift of um seeing those numbers in shopify and kind of seeing those those numbers uh just in general for a guy who was around uh around my age was like a big paradigm shift for me and and like made me really believe like all right it's possible um but for sure like i still try and approach it like that so i mean yeah like even though i've had some success still not really where like I want to be, but also, uh, try and learn from everyone. So, you know, even, even people who are sort of doing less than us in, in revenue and profit, let's say are probably doing some things better than us in their business. It might be like their retention or they could be crushing organic or their creative strategy might be better. So, uh, yeah, I think you sort of just do yourself a disservice when you, when you stop trying to learn and, and, you know, think certain people are below or above or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. What would you say is like the most notable or memorable thing that you learned from your time, like working with, uh, Udi and and Davey? Uh, probably just like, uh, I mean, he was the first person I sort of like came across who just openly said they wanted to, and was going to be a billionaire. Like I'd Mm -hmm. never met anyone who just said that, um, which I found like, kind of weird at the time um but but looking back it was like yeah just to but just to have the the confidence and even just to to say like this is where i want to be this is the vision we have and this is how we're going to get there um so that was probably the biggest thing honestly just like that that um that that mindset and self-belief as kind of woo woo and cheesy as it is the other thing as well is he's kind of probably failed the most times that i know out of anyone so he's had like you know investments that have gone south where he's probably lost millions and failed brands and this and that but you know he's probably also the most successful person that i'm sort of you know could call a friend so um i think that's a good lesson like the guy who's 
failed the most is also the most successful mm -hmm. that I know. Um, yeah. So that's probably the, the, the other big lesson that I took from him as well. Yeah, because a, a lot of people that are, mostly people that are starting out are, the, their biggest fear is failure, right? And, and what I always see is, it's like, you know, like for example, if I'm coaching somebody, right, on, on building an agency and I'm like, you know, did you do the things that I said to do like two weeks ago? And they're like, no, I'm just waiting for like this, you know, insert excuse. You know, I want it to be like the perfect time to get started. It's like, look, the, the fucking perfect time isn't ever going to come. Like the stars never align. The only way that the stars align is that if you, if you fuck up so many times that everything eventually falls into place and through trial and error, you find what actually, because you're never going to hit it. Well, I, I'm talking to the guy who did hit it, the first e-com brand that they did. <laughs> but like for most people, for most mere mortals, most people don't hit it big on their first time. You know, it's going to take, and, I'll, and obviously within that first brand, you had months of probably failures and setbacks and wasted money on ads and maybe supply chain issues and all this bullshit. But within that, within all those failures is what you learn to actually make it work because there isn't a set path to making, you know, millions of dollars. It's, it's always like a, an up and down, left and right, you know, uh, journey to actually learn what is going to work through trial and error. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I guess the, the thing I try and think about is like, as long as the mistakes don't like bankrupt you, I mean, even if, they, mm -hmm. even if they do, you can always just like spin up something new and make money again. But like, yeah, I, I kind of see it that way. It's like, you just don't want to be like bankrupting yourself with mistakes. And then otherwise you've pretty much got, you know, as many, as many free hits as possible to, to learn as much as possible. And then really like, I think, yeah, I think Davey was the one that said it to me. He's like, if you just keep reinvesting in your own skills and in your own things and, and keep like willing to fail, you just have more money than you'll know what to do with eventually. Mm -hmm. Like it'll, that, that, that's kind of how it ends. Um, so that's, I mean, that's how it is for him, but hopefully it mm -hmm. ends up like that for me as well. <laughs> yeah, oh, I will, I will. So we're coming into the last like two, three minutes. So I want to jump into, I want to end it on a, what would be your advice for someone that's, getting into e-commerce. They want to actually start an e-com brand and scale it to, you know, whatever, six figures profit, seven figures rev, whatever. What would be like your initial advice for somebody like that? Um, I would say keep it really simple. So like focus on, um, yeah, focus on the big three. So like health, wealth, relationships, and like a subset, you know, a problem that Obviously, everything relates to the big three, right? But like, if, if you can find something that's like very obviously, uh, you know, a market with with a big with a big deep pain point, or like a product that solves a big deep pain point, where you don't have to like do too much digging, where it's quite obvious, I think that's the easiest way to start because then it's very simple. It's like this problem, and then you know, this is our solution, and then everything just becomes a lot easier from there. Um, mm -hmm. And odds are then it's like, okay, well, market has this problem. This product solves that problem. I know that for, for sure. And it's still not working. So maybe my messaging is a bit off or my creative is a bit off. I think if you, if you've sort of conjured up some product or, or some problem that doesn't necessarily exist, uh, then it makes it really hard because maybe all your strategy and execution is hundred percent right, but you're just selling something that no one wants or yeah. the problem you're solving, no one actually really has. So, I think, yeah, just keep it super simple and focus on like deep pain points and, and broad markets um, as your first thing. And then you, you can't really go too wrong. I think going too niche uh, is, is, is like uh, a bit of a, an uphill battle in e-com. And by too niche, I mean like, you know, if you wanted to sell like, you know, something like this. <laughs> like yeah. don't sell that shit. <laughs> pen holder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you could literally be Googling up like the, the top 20 most common health problems in the USA or like, you know, just use search tools to find out what is going to be the the biggest concern in each of those three levels. So health, wealth, relationships, just pick one, whatever feels like most attractive to you yeah. and start researching what the most common fears are of these people. Even look in the news, like see what the news is trying to instill fear in, in these people right now. Like the rising cost of living and this disease is getting, you know, more prevalent and, you know, this thing is on the rise. Like then you can start to look into the subset of that and see, right. Okay. How many people have this health problem? How many people are 
having this specific, you know, financial problem. Okay, why are they having it? What are their fears around it? Start Googling and doing forums and stuff and find out the real problems behind it and then see if there's anybody selling a product similar in that space that is actually making money. And then you have like your confirmation of two things. You know there's a problem. You know people are actually, you know, facing that shit. And you know there's somebody else that's making money in the space from that problem. You just now need to take that same thing, depending if it's like a new thing, there's like one guy, you could probably just copy it and do the same thing. But if it's a little bit more uh, uh, yeah. competitive, then you need to go into that third thing that we talked about earlier, which is repackaging that offer in a brand new way that people haven't seen it before. And then you come into the market, you tap into that same problem, that existing pool of buyers, but with a new you know, solution for their problem. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the the simplest way, like I know I said, go problem problem first earlier. Um, but honestly, like the simplest way is like find something that's already selling and just like put a small tweak on it. So if it's selling, you know, really well on one ad platform, but not another, maybe you just take it to a different platform or, you know, their creative suck, you do better creatives or they're not using direct response or long form. So you'll use long form, just like some little tweak that you can make. Uh, and it's super simple to get some traction and get something to work. Perfect. All right, we're up. We've hit an R. So, Paul, where where can everybody find you on like social media? Like, do you want to promote anything? Do you want to pu push your socials? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm active on Twitter more than anything else. So, uh, my handle is Paul Nicholas Eight. Uh, so, yeah, just follow me there. If you've got questions, DM, and uh, I'll I'll get to them eventually. And follow the DM advice that we give you in this podcast, or else you're going to get ignored. <laughs> All right, bro. <laughs> yeah, if you've got good questions, DM. <laughs> All right, bro. It was good to talk to you. I'm just going to stop the recording now. <laughs>